everybody and Merry Christmas, and Happy Holidays. Um, I'm John Giardinelli, I'm Association Counsel, and this is the last rant of 2023. So um, we're gonna cover a couple of areas like a potpourri today. We're gonna talk about some things that happened last week. We're gonna talk about some questions that came in last week, uh, and then I'm gonna follow it up if we have time with just a couple of the new laws that I think are significant. But if I if I don't get to that because of time, we'll probably do it again uh, uh, pretty soon, maybe even do a newsletter. So uh, uh, first of all, last week we had a legal panel. When I say last week, I'm doing this program on uh, December the 19th. And uh, last week on the 14th, we had a legal panel with uh, one of the speakers was uh, uh, Steve Lerner, who is the uh, Chief Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Real Estate and um, is in charge of all the legal affairs for that department. Steve's a great guy, brilliant lawyer. And um, what I wanted to tell you about, in case you didn't get a chance to see the program, is Steve kind of uh, dove into uh, all these, we, we were talking about all these lawsuits that are coming down against compensation and the multiple listing services in NAR. And, and, and the likely response from the Department of Real Estate. And he made some really good points. First of all, fiduciary duty is still fiduciary duty. Um, the, the, the highest obligations that you have to your client aren't going to change. The duties to be honest with your client, to uh, provide them with all the information that you have available to you is not going to change. But what change, what may change are some of the approaches that we take to some of those issues. So for example, while you will still have a fiduciary duty, uh, it will be incredibly important that you be accurate in discussing things like your compensation. As the compensation rules change, and I firmly believe that they will uh, very, very soon, uh, you're gonna have a duty to simply explain to your client, look, this is the way I charge, this is what you're gonna get, for that, you know, the value proposition. And um, that's going to be simply Im important. And we're going to guide you every step of the way. I've already talked to the to the leadership and, and they're absolutely bound and determined to provide classes and programs and anything you need. Obviously, you're going to need to take advantage of all this, but but you're going to have access to some some great information, I think. The, the other thing that might change, uh, is, is sort of the standards of practice. Right now, uh, some of you are using written uh, broker representation agreements and uh, uh, are providing information about your, your companies and your personal uh, uh, means of, 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 of being compensated. And that's going to become much, much more uh, uh, formalized as time goes on. I believe, and, and Steve, believes, and, and so does the MLS attorney, that buyer broker compensation agreements will no longer become optional, but they'll be basically mandatory. Additionally, under both the Business and Professions Code and the Code of Ethics, there'll be requirements that you talk about your compensation, what you normally charge, and all of that. So that's going to be expanded. And we're going to go over that Lori and I are talking about doing brown bags and 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 all kinds of other programs. Um, sorry about that. Got to turn off my phone. Uh, we're going to be talking about all sorts of stuff in the in the first part of the year. So we did get a bunch of questions. So let me just tell you uh, about some of the questions um, that came up during this panel that we weren't necessarily able to get to because, frankly, there were so many questions. Uh, one of the questions that came in is, do we foresee an increase in uh, double ending and dual agency? And the response is possibly. Certainly as, as buyer brokers have to negotiate their compensation and get written agreements, buyers may decide to go straight to the listing broker and there may be some conduct that um, uh, will lead to that. We, we don't, we don't want that to happen because frankly it's it's the opinion of a lot of people from both the legal and risk management side as well as from a service side the dual agency is not in the best interest of of the industry and particularly the clients so we don't know 
We're going to track it. We'll keep you posted. Um, the next question I thought was an excellent question, which is how do we convince a buyer uh, that they should have their own agent? And, and the fact is, is that a fiduciary that represents both sides to any transaction, whether it's a lawyer, whether it's a, a realtor, uh, how do you discharge that fiduciary duty fully if you're representing both sides? For example, if I'm a realtor and I'm representing both the buyer and the seller, how do I negotiate, right? I can't negotiate against my client for my client. So I'm representing the seller, the buyer wants to negotiate the price. How do I do that fully and effectively? How do I uh, uh, represent the, the buyer correctly if there's a problem with the property and repairs, but also represent the seller property. So I think if you sit down, create a plan, put together all the different kinds of scenarios for why you're, you're having your own separate independent representation is a good idea. And, and we're going to help you with that. We just did a newsletter on the value proposition. I think the idea that you know, you're free to negotiate fully. You're you're knowledgeable about the market, about the local area. Uh, that you you have access to a multiple listing service. That you know how to navigate. I think all of those things are are going to be critical. We were asked, what do we think the appropriate length of a BRBC agreement should be, and when should it be signed? All of us agreed that it should be signed as soon as possible. Both, both Ed Zorn, the MLS attorney, who's also a broker, and myself believe that you should sign it, if you possibly can, under most circumstances, before you start showing property. How long should it be? It, it depends on the circumstances. You know, what is your buyer willing to tie themselves to you for? Two weeks, 30 days, longer? That's really going to be your call. Um, does everybody need to have written policies? We were talking to uh, the Department of Real Estate. If you ever get an inquiry regarding some conduct, it, it's going to be it's going to be very very important that you have written policies in place, whether it's about um, showings, about information sharing, about compensation. All of those things need to be included. Advertising, all of that needs to be included in the company's written policies and and because the, the the department of real estate is going to ask for them um how do you set your fees that's going to be totally uh, up to you uh, i'm working with some new york lawyers right now and their fees flabbergast me but then they're in new york right and so it just depends on where you are how complex it is uh, what the what what you think is is fair for your level of experience and all of the rest of that. Um, are there going to be some legal changes? Well, we can foresee that the legislature may act, and uh, based on what's going on in Washington State and what's going on in Oregon, uh, we won't be surprised if the California State Legislature makes buyer side representation agreements mandatory so keep an eye on that uh, we'll keep you posted as those uh, issues develop and then uh the, the last question is really self-evident which is it had to do with you know uh, how do we persuade how do we talk what do we say and the answer is tell the truth what, whatever you you and your broker or you and your company decide to do and this came directly from the dre uh, one thing they're not going to tolerate is, is a misrepresentation and misleading of a client. So it is critically important that you um, uh, tell the truth in everything that you do uh, and then let the client decide. I had a question come in. Uh, uh, is CRMLS considering artificial in intelligence? And yes, they are. Uh, they're, they're going to be doing... Uh, uh, work with artificial intelligence in uh, rule compliance. And so uh, that is uh, something that they uh, are planning on doing. Then we had a question regarding the specific duties that a landlord has when representing a, a landlord, or that a property manager has when representing a landlord. 
And I'm going to cover that in the next rant because it really is a whole uh, rant kind of a thing. All right, so you are in California. You are lucky enough to have a legislature that is very, very active. And as a result, um, you have 860 new laws that this legislature passed. And I'm certainly not going to cover all of them. I'm only going to cover a few of them. And um, so let me kind of go through some of these with you right now and um, tell you, uh, again, we're going to talk about just a few of, of 860. The legislature has instructed that the Homeowner's Guide to Environmental Hazards booklet be updated, but they didn't provide any time frame or money. So just know that probably sometime in 2024, uh, uh, you'll be told that there is a new uh, booklet for uh, um, uh, disclosures uh, in the environmental hazards uh, booklet. Um, on January the 1st, a new law will go into effect. So if you represent what are commonly referred to as flippers, uh, a, a new law will go into effect that will expand disclosures. If the property is a residential unit, if the, if the seller who is flipping the property acquired title within 18 months uh, of, from uh, the date of transfer, uh, and if uh, renovations or repairs were performed by a contractor, uh, uh, then you must make additional disclosures regarding room additions, structural modifications, and other repairs. Uh, again, uh, the law will be very expansive. The law does not go into effect on January the 1st. It goes into effect on July the 1st, and they will be making some changes to the transfer disclosure statement between now and July that will then need to be filled out if you are in the category known as a flipper. Um, NHD statements will be modified, and those NHD statements will uh, identify specific fire hazard zones and defensible space. Uh, CAR has announced that they will be modifying some of the sales transaction documents that will uh, go into effect. Um, uh, so uh, be aware of that and we'll keep you posted on the changes as they take place. For those of you that do property management uh, on uh, January the 1st, uh, a new law will go into effect that if I am a disabled tenant and I live in a community where there is some form of rent control, I will be entitled if a property becomes available, or excuse me, a unit becomes available um, uh, on the main floor of the building uh, and I have a permanent disability, I will be entitled to move into that same or similar unit without an increase in rent uh, on a, on a, a, a right of first refusal. Uh, it's a complicated law. We're going to do a newsletter and we'll keep you posted. But if you have any questions, uh, let us know uh, because it, it will now be uh, the duty of a landlord uh, where possible to accommodate a disabled tenant uh, by allowing that tenant to move into a uh, accessible first floor unit. Um, uh, there is going to be some changes in the way that uh, you look at history. Uh, uh, and if a tenant can establish that despite bad credit, they have the ability to pay. Um, and this is primarily going to be geared toward people uh, in uh, government uh, subsidized housing, such as Section 8, then you're going to need to accommodate them. So you'll you'll need to provide applicants who fail the credit test with reasonable time to respond and provide alternative evidence of their ability to pay uh, the rent that you're asking. This falls under uh, the, the rules in California that um, uh, the source of income is not significant. The ability to pay is, is what is important. Uh, Going to be some changes uh, to some rules. Uh, if you're uh, tenants uh, have balconies uh, and they have electric bikes 
or other uh, type of transportation, mi mini bikes, micro ability, micro mobility devices. Uh, they're going to be allowed to store them on the balcony with or without the rules that you have uh, uh, for that type of stuff. And again, um, uh, we'll, we'll keep you posted. That law goes into effect on January the 1st. It's limited uh, to certain kinds of buildings, and it's, uh, but it, it does allow for exterior secure long-term storage of these types of devices. Um, some cities have passed crime-free legislation, and the legislature has put some strict interpretation on that so that um, a lot of cities, particularly uh, this arose out of a case out in Hesperia, um, where they tried to prevent uh, 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 criminals from renting apartments, and that fell in the face of California law regarding discrimination and disparate impact on certain classes of people. So that's going to be limited and, and local governments are going to be restricted on how they can enforce that. Uh, on July the 1st, security deposits will be limited in most circumstances to one month. There will be exceptions for small landlords. These are landlords that have less than three units. In other words, two units or two, two buildings with not more than four total units. Uh, and then the security deposit uh, will be uh, for properties that are more than that. Uh, you'll you'll end up with a one month instead of a two month security deposit. Um, they're going to tighten up uh, uh, under the rent control law, the, 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 the statewide rent control law, uh, the ability to terminate a tenancy uh, by owner or relationship move in. Uh, they're going to require uh, that there be specific time frames, specific proof that the uh, property is in fact uh, um, going to be occupied uh, by a, a close family uh, relationship and, and so forth. So that's going to be taking place uh, very, very soon. Uh, and you're going to need to keep an eye on that if you're planning on moving out a tenant in order to put in a, uh, a, a person of close relationship or yourself. Um, the DRE is going to be required as of January the 1st to honor uh, gender changes and uh, licensee name changes to reflect gender identification. Uh, on January the 1st, listing agreements uh, will now have a two-year maximum uh, limitation. Uh, this is to uh, combat some practices that some realtors in other states are, are using to uh, record listing agreements. You will not be allowed to do that. Um, and uh, we'll go over that law with you at the next brown bag in a little more detail. Um, and then lastly, so I want to be, make you aware that small claims uh, will now go up to $12,500 so that if you have a security or a uh, deposit dispute, let's say, for example, that the seller believes they're entitled to keep the deposit, the buyer be believes they're entitled to get it back, uh, that will now, uh, if, if the deposit is $12,500 or less, uh, you can now uh, go to small claims court without availing yourself of mediation and or arbitration. So that's it for now. Um, I wish you all a, the happiest of holiday seasons and a prosperous New Year's. Things are gonna be very, very complicated come January the 1st, lots of things are gonna change, but you belong to an association that is absolutely dedicated to making sure that you keep up. We'll do the best we can and um, uh, to make your lives as comfortable as possible. So in the meantime, have a blessed holiday season, a Merry Christmas, and um, we wish you a prosperous new year. Thank you very much. Thanks.